me Shinewe. Um, so we're going to share with you, as Daryl mentioned, we've been working on this wellness model for quite some time. But before we do, I'm going to make a shameless plug. Our team is also in the process of um, speaking with the alumni of the Heritage Award program. So if you are a current alum, well, I guess an alum of the program, uh, our table is back there. Susan, Tracy, Rave, stop by and just see what ways you can engage with our team. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the development of Nahe Meto Sinawinge, the our Miamia Living Well model. Before we do, neither of us have any conflicts of interest, but our work is uh, support for this research is provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of the foundation. So I cheke ki shikoko wins wa ane ne hinila miamikuya. Hi everyone, my name is Haley Shea, and I am a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. I said it's good to see you all here today. Um, so I currently work as a research associate at the Miamia Center, and I serve as the director of the Office of Assessment and Evaluation. You know, I grew up attending our tribe's um, camps, basically. I didn't really know what it meant to be Miamia for the first portion of my life. Um, always heard stories and knew I was Miamia, but that really solidified first when I attended camp when I was in 2005. I would have been like 14-ish at the time. Um, and through that, through that experience, I saw there were these students at Miami University and I wanted to be like them. So I came to Miami University as an undergraduate student. I studied psychology and Spanish. And at that point, I knew that I wanted to do something to give back to the tribe because the tribe had done so much for me. And so I spoke with some folks here at the center with Daryl, with George, and was encouraged to do something that could stand alone, but that I could also give back to the community. And nobody really knew what shape that would take. But I ultimately pursued a PhD in counseling psychology from Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, um, studied cross-cultural mental health. I did my dissertation on the impact of Miamia storytelling on living well. Um, came back to Miami for my doctoral internship in the 2018-19 school year. And then after graduation, came into this role as a research associate at the Miamia Center. So I work half-time uh, here, and then I also have a private practice providing therapy services in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and... You know, the, the, I will talk a little bit more about the history of my team, our office, but this work provides tangible feedback to the center and the tribe about how our educational programming in the tribe benefits Miamia citizens. So I will pass it on now to Dr. Paul Branscom. Thanks, Haley, for that. Um, so my name is Dr. Paul Branscom, and I'm a faculty member here at Miami University in the Department of Kinesiology, Nutrition, and Health in the Public Health Program. Um, I'm not a member of the tribe, but I was welcomed in by the group in 2021 when they were starting this project and looking for someone with expertise in survey development and survey design. And, and so I'll just briefly say that I knew coming into this project it wasn't going to be something that I could just easily slide into like other research projects and research teams I've worked with in the past. I knew it would take time to build trust with the center um, and the team and really try to understand from a cultural perspective what it was that they were trying to accomplish. Um, and so as you'll see today um, in our presentation with the survey development, uh, we knew going into this, or at least I did, um, this wasn't going to be looking at uh, existing surveys about health and just putting in Miami words. Um, this was really going to be, especially for me, unlearning what I sort of thought about health and the concepts and really try to approach these concepts that Haley's going to talk about from just a brand new perspective. Um, so again, thank you. And I'll turn it over to Haley for a very uh, interesting and great presentation. Anyway. So out of the context of the language and cultural revitalization really movement um, in the 90s, early 2000s, our tribal leadership started to notice some significant changes in our community, right? People were coming to events again. We had, you know, more and more every single year. We had people asking questions about various things about being Miamia. We had people enrolling their kids in the tribe again when they had stopped doing so. And so they tasked 
um, Daryl and the center with putting together a team to really understand what are the benefits of language and cultural revitalization for our community. And so that started the Nipwayone Acquisition and Assessment Team in 2012. I was a heritage student, but Dr. Susan Mosley Howard really pioneered that. And uh, over time, our team has just grown and grown as the center has grown and the needs for evaluation and assessment work has also grown. And so we eventually, in 2019, became the Office of Assessment and Evaluation with three teams, the Nipwayone Acquisition and Assessment Team, we have a Program Evaluation Team, and a Language Assessment Team within our office. And so I also share these photos here so that you can see that our work is not solely academic, right? It is entirely embedded within our tribal community. The driving force behind our work and the ultimate beneficiary of our work is the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. Therefore, we operate within this academic space and each of us have earned degrees in higher education, but we send her first and foremost within the tribal community. And so in 2012, when the team was being formed, our team sat down with tribal leadership to say, what is it that we're interested in? What outcomes are important to us as a community? And together identified four questions. To what degree do language and cultural education impact academic attainment, well-being, community connectedness and engagement, and national tribal growth and continuance, right? And so between 2012 and 2018, 2019, we developed really strong protocol for one, three, and four. But this issue of number two <laughs> has always felt really, really slippery to our team, right? This idea of wellness, what does it mean to live well? Um, historically, the way that this is defined in Indian country across indigenous groups is through basically suggesting that all indigenous communities are exactly the same, and also from a deficit perspective. And what I mean by that is looking at the problems in Indian country, what are alcoholism rates, what are suicide rates, what are you know domestic violence rates, and how do we overcome that? Right, but our community wanted to take a, an approach that is grounded in our knowledge system and looks at the strengths of our community and how do we promote those strengths, assuming then that those strengths and, and enhancing the resilience of our community will also help take care of some of those other issues that likely exist. Um, and so, so that's what I'm gonna share with you today. And in showing a little bit about this strengths-based perspective, I wanna share the evolution of our research question across time. So we started with what we would call a Western perspective, right? We, we really marry like this Western and indigenous perspective, both provide strengths um, and both allow us to communicate with different types of people. And so we started with this Western question of does language and cultural education impact well-being, right? Like that's this overarching umbrella question. And then our team got together with language and cultural experts to write a question that is from asking this similar thing from a Miamia perspective. And that came out to Tanije Nehemeh Tosene Wiangwe, Wechilandiangwe, Nehetehendiangwe, Melone Tehengwile, Kenepwayo Nemenane. And then directly translating that back to English, it comes out as, how does reflecting on our ways of knowing cause us to live properly and to be at peace with each other? Right? So you can see that there's a significant difference between that first and third question. Right? So emphasizing it's not just this formal educational process that matters, it's the reflection upon our knowledge system that is important. And that happens both on an individual and communal level. And then there's this idea of living properly, our word that I've said several times, na hemeto sinewingi, is our word for, we call it living well, but directly translated means to live a proper human life, right? And then I'll talk in a moment about this concept of peace, but the idea that health and peace are intricately connected. And so because this research question had not been fully developed, Daryl and I sat down really during the like lockdown portion of COVID, <laughs> and met weekly for a couple of years to talk about this and do research on this, on this topic. Um, we pulled sources, including you know, things from the archives, linguistic materials, interviews with elders, and we shared stories of things that others have shared with us from within and outside of our community, as well as our own personal experiences and things we can extrapolate from that. 
And we simultaneously sought out and received support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to be able to create this model of well-being, as well as what Dr. Branscombe will share, the, the actual measurement tool that we're using within the community today. And so I begin here sharing the model with a set of hands as a representation that our system comes about through our human experience and that our indigenous knowledge system was handed to us by previous generations in order that we may thrive as a tribal nation. And in order to frame our epistemic belief system, I begin with the term pelakione. This term contains the stem pelaki that is used in terms such as anje pelakiche, she or he reforms his or her life for the better. It's also found in terms such as pelaki haki, I healed him, and in certain contexts can mean I grant him or her freedom. As a simple noun, this pelakione is translated as health, but the core meaning of the stem is to improve one's condition. Now that we've established this, we also uh, pulled from this, this word awendione that's in the left there, in the left hand. This contains the stem awem that is used in terms such as ewemake, I am related to him or her, or ewengiche, she or he is grateful or thankful. And as a simple noun, awendione is translated as peace. The core meaning of this term really gets at the idea that relationships are important for our human existence, right? And so this is showing you how our language informs our understanding of this, but this idea that health and peace are intricately connected that can't really be separated is found in across the globe. Many, most communities that I've seen talk about this, this connection between health and peace. But now that we've established a baseline for Pilakione and Awendione, we turn our attention to the expressive and intellectual features of Nahime Tosenewingi. So this next layer of meaning for our model includes three integrated domains that include five Nipwayone. Nipwayone is knowledge competencies. You heard that in Nipwayone acquisition and assessment team. Our team is literally looking at the acquisition of knowledge. Um, eight, michelione, community values, and five, miami wingi, which we translate as intentional interactions. And this layer of our model came from years of research and work, and each of these three domains together forms that epistemic foundation. And the next and final layer could be viewed as our plan, implementation, and evaluation process for nahimeto sinewingi. Using our indigenous knowledge for the benefit of our community requires both strategic and sustainable planning um, that ensures a measurable outcome. After the research and inform information gathering takes place, that information must be prepared for a infusion into a growing educational platform. This includes curricular development, teacher training, and program design, all part of our educational development process. And then both through formal and informal sharing, we rely heavily on the Miami Tribe's Cultural Resources Office to oversee the community program implementation, right? So infusing this understanding into our actual programs. We currently have educational programs for each age group from cradle to grave. Lifelong learning and community engagement is the goal. And the last step in our process is the evaluation, which is where my team comes in to gather in information on the impacts of language and cultural revitalization and on the educational programming on well-being in the community, which then serves to basically inform this model again. And to understand if Nahimeto Sinewingi is merging across age groups and through the generations. Together, all of this, all of these components is Nahe Meto Sinewinge, is living well. So I'm gonna break down each of these a bit further. So we'll start with Nipwayone, the knowledge. I present this first because it is really a prerequisite for the other two, right? So without knowledge, you can't really live well, you can't, or you can't, sorry, live through your values, you also can't intentionally interact with the world in identifiably Miamia ways. With, uh, the process of knowledge acquisition is also considered to be a lifelong process, right? It starts at birth and continues throughout the entire duration of one's life. 
This knowledge can be formally attained, acquired through educational programming like our summer programs, like the Heritage Awards program here at Miami, but it can also be engaged or acquired more informally just by engaging with the world around you, right? Just by figuring things out, interacting with other people. Um, and we really break down from a Miami perspective these knowledge competencies into five areas. So we have akemawione, civic knowledge, na kaniake, ancestral or historical knowledge, miamia tawenge, language competence, miamina kosingi, identity expression, and ashikue kishikwe, ecology. And so I'll break down for each of these, I don't have time to go into each examples of each domain, but I'll break down one as an example. So with miami na kosingi, that number four, identity expression, this refers to one's individual cultural knowledge. We see there being, as, being so many areas of cultural knowledge, um, just the way that we are able to understand and express our identity. And this includes things like dancing, singing, art, games, storytelling, right, and so much more. And not every Miami person does or needs to have complete competence in every single one of those. But when we connect with a certain area based on our interests, based on our skills, that helps to promote our own well-being and the well-being of the entire community. And in order to live well, we have to have a general understanding of how each of these domains uh, is expressed and what we're striving to gain more knowledge throughout our lives. So an important, again, value, which is in the next step, is uh, lifelong learning, right? Being a lifelong learner. So, me che leone, our Miamia values. So I just wrote a blog post on this, so if anybody is curious about this and wants to hear more, that is on our community blog. But, you know, we typically use this uh, Wikiame Mandepoye, the lodge frame, to visually and metaphorically represent our value system, right? Recognizing that this, this lodge is what our homes, our traditional homes, um, the structure of that. And the home is where values are promoted, right? That's where values are passed down across the generations just through daily living. And I don't have time again to break down all of them, but I want to give you the, the notion, I wanna instill the notion that values are essentially when everything else is stripped away, it's what guides and directs our behavior. It's what tells us as a community what is important to us. How do we treat one another? And so I'll give you one. The ne kayangwe is a great one to use for this purpose. It means we are wise, we are conscious, we are aware. This reminds us that awareness and consciousness of the way things are within our surroundings is important. It reminds us to stay present, to try to understand and gain the wisdom that each moment is trying to teach us. And this curiosity and awareness is really what allowed us as a community to remain so resilient in the face of significant adversity. It's also why we tend to um, highly respect our elders, right? So our elders have lived longer than we have and have often, though not always, <laughs> gained more wisdom than the rest of us. And so we, we really value the wisdom that elders bring. And this is even evident in how we part from one another, right? So many of you will, un, many of you say this phrase often of nipuakalo, the command form of this, which means be conscious, be aware, be a wise. We say that when we leave people, when we part from people, to remind them of this value. And that brings us to miami wingi, intentional interactions. And so what I mean by this is that each of us, each of our beings has a soul, and that soul engages with the world around us, right? Engages with the in environment. And when we're living properly, we intentionally act with informed knowledge and through our value systems. This is the culminating expressive component of our knowledge and our values. So our being interacts with the domains of awiawe, the physical body, mihtoseniake, the people or the social environment, manitawione, the spiritual or other than human beings, eshiteheone, thought and mentality, and miamiongi, our place, our homelands. So when we act uh, intentionally, when our soul, our being acts intentionally in each of those dom domains, we are promoting our well-being. But when we act thoughtlessly or carelessly, that opens us up to vulnerability and potentially not living well. And so again, to use one as an example, the awiawe, the physical body, 
We view our body as the biological or the physical structure that enables us to live a human life. And we must tend to that body similarly to how we tend to our land or to our social environment, right? We have to care for it. And so historically, when we lived in a village centric society, that was pretty easy, right? It was done in tasks of daily living, things that required us to be able to eat and to interact with one another. Today, we have to be much more intentional but we can do it in culturally appropriate ways, such as playing Piquetta Hominge, right? When we play lacrosse, we're taking care of our physical body, along with every other one of these, right? Um, so you can really see through this model how our understanding of living well is unique and therefore deserves its own model, right? And deserves its own way of measuring or understanding it. And so to conclude my portion, I want to share two metaphors, right? Metaphors are a very common way that we express con concepts, really complex concepts in our community that attempt to capture the importance of understanding both change and cycles that emerge through our work. And the first is represented by this basket that's held by two hands, right? Baskets don't grow on trees, but the materials used to make them come from our ecological knowledge, skill, and need. This elm, bar elm bark basket you see here represents the boundaries of our knowledge system that was handed to us by previous generations. And our lunar calendar system marks time and transition and represents our ecological relationship to our homelands. Although the cycles are recurring across time, no two months are the same. And so we see the education and evaluation process of our work as continually evolving every single year. So I hope this gives you an understanding of the depth of the meaning and the interpretation for Nahimeto Sinewingi and everything that's involved in our work uh, that helps us to understand wellness to be an outcome of passing our Miyamiya ways of knowing and being to a future generation. So I will pass it on now to Dr. Paul Branscombe. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. I'll start by saying, you know, there's a lot of, there's many different ways you can develop a survey. And so um, coming into this, I, I really kind of thought about a good systematic process that we could use. And what I kind of landed on was the Charmin Potosa method um, that they published in their book years ago. And it essentially kind of breaks down what others had done into, um, like I said, a, a nice 16 step process. And as I reflected through that process, I kind of thought, you know, the first six steps really focus on the conceptual phase. Conceptual phase is where you're really trying to figure out what are you trying to measure, uh, what are the objects, and how do you, you put concise definitions into those. Um, the second phase is the developmental phase. That's where you put pen to paper and you actually write your survey items and try to, again, match your survey items to your concepts to see if you're covering enough, you know, you don't want too many items, you don't want too little items, um, so you want to be uh, comprehensive in that way. And then the very last phase is this validity and reliability phase, and that's where you're actually taking your survey, you collect some data, and you essentially see is your survey consistent over time, so is it reliable, and is your survey actually trying to measure what it is you intend for it to measure, and that's with validity. Um, a couple other points on this slide I'll just mention is we definitely appreciate that survey design is an iterative process. And so one of our consultants on our project is Dr. Roy Oman, who worked at University of Oklahoma and one of, was one of the developers of the Youth Asset Study that was done out there. And, you know, he very early on told us his story of working, you know, decades with that project. And very much they started like we did with an idea, a concept, and really just sitting down with a team and, and going through a, a procedure very similar to ours. But it really boiled down to creating scales, questions, uh, getting data, reflecting on that data and what it was telling them, removing items, deleting items, creating new scales. Um, so we understand we're at the very first phase of this process, and we definitely expect that you know as years go on, the survey will continue to grow and develop, and uh, maybe even develop new concepts that we uh, haven't touched on. And then the last point here talks about survey development in the community context, and you know again, I, I think 
as a researcher and as a social in social science, I think it's important to just acknowledge that some of the stuff that we do can kind of live in this messy space, you know. And I think that's especially true when you're working with communities in real time, you know, applying some of the research methods that we use and, and teach our students every day. Um, you know, when I started this this project out and they were telling me about this i said well great you know you're trying to measure this concept of health give me your definitions and we'll just sort of build it out from there and what i was told very early on was like well you know <laughs> we're not really quite there yet we're, we're developing those definitions and some of the work that we're going to be doing is actually uh, meant to strengthen and continually develop these definitions um, and so again kind of living in that messy space again pushed me and challenged me as a researcher to do so. Um, so thinking about where we started, you know, the first six steps being uh, really the conceptual phase, um, you know, as Haley presented, Daryl and, and Haley did a lot of work to look at historical documents and really think about, you know, a, a beginning part um, and a beginning draft, I should say of this and you know to strengthen those definitions that they had developed we next did a series of focus groups with tribal citizens um, in different areas of the country uh, really just to hear from them and what health and these concepts meant to them on an individual and community level um, you know at the time we we had the the initial draft of the wellness model and so we formulated open-ended questions and as we talked with community members and you know, as we're reading through these transcripts, again, it kind of challenged us, I think, as community members were, were talking, is what they were saying really part of the model that maybe we haven't acknowledged that stands to be updated? Um, and, and we did that. We, we, we updated some of the definitions of, of the constructs. Um, and we challenged us to think, well, could these be uh, issues that are outside of the model that again could be added to the model now or at a later time. Um, so give you an idea about that. Um, Haley talked about a number of the constructs in the knowledge construct, civic knowledge um, was the very first one. And we talked about, you know, what is knowledge? Um, and, and we sort of broke it down into, well, you can possess the knowledge of the tribe and how the political landscape looks like, um, the tribal constitution, you can know it. Um, you can seek knowledge, right? You can by um, going to tribal events and learning about the politics that are going on. Um, or you can use that knowledge in some way, right? By voting or just other ways. And so again, that really helped us conceptualize a measure um, that I'll share with you here in a second. The next phase was to um, develop the survey items, and I can tell you that we first really looked at a number of existing surveys, um, the World Health Organization's uh, concept on wellness, the RAND Corporation, the Youth Asset Study I talked about with Roy Oman, um, and it really kind of helped us frame the items, you know, looking at should they be very broad items, specific items, somewhere in the middle. Um, and so we ended up probably reviewing 150, 200 items, um, we reviewed them, we thought about questions that maybe we would develop from scratch, and we ended up with a, uh, a first draft, a first draft that we could then share with you know, Daryl, we shared with our outside experts um, to really get to a point where we could um, pilot test it. And again, this is just an example of knowledge, uh, of the knowledge section and how we went and tried to evaluate this. And there were different scales, like I said, that you would look at these. And so, um, you know, possessing knowledge, seeking knowledge and participating. And so I don't have much time, so I'm going to try to um, rush through this. But uh, essentially, we got to the very last part looking at the validity and reliability. And that's actually where we're at now. Um, when we went to collect data, we, we kind of used a hands on approach. Um, all hands on deck approach, I should say, uh, where we had Haley posting on tribal specific social media. Uh, we had the chief make a video, which I thought was really kind of special. Um, we were at the winter gathering uh, this year, trying to just sign people up. And we ended up with now, uh, I believe about 717 tribal citizens that have taken the survey. So we're just at the point now where we're looking at some of the statistics 
to kind of see again how valid, how reliable our measures. We know that we're going to be doing this again, but that's kind of going to give us our first step into seeing you know, how everything looks good. And I can tell you from just the preliminary analysis that we've had, um, things really do look good. And, and even our outside consultant, Haley, can say, um, was kind of su surprised at how good the survey, how the initial results really looked. Um, and so I thank you for your time. You know, just a final thing, when you think about developing surveys like this and, and this exercise that we took, this isn't something that's going to just sit now and collect data and we'll just generate reports. We really want to think about how this survey can be used in across all different types of uh, tribal events and opportunities to think about evaluation um, for this wellness model and, and whether or not these surveys get used, you know, in part, in whole, or get adapted for certain groups like kids or elders. Um, that's sort of, you know, the things that we're looking at towards the future. So thank you.